All right, again, last week we um, did verses 9 to 19 of chapter 3. We're going to finish up chapter 3 this week. But in the review, this is the verse that's important throughout, uh, not just uh, this first verse, verse 9, not just in the review, but it's important in the lesson we're going to share this week too. Uh, Because Paul asked the Jews that are in the church at Rome, the Christian Jews that are in the church at Rome, so are we Jews better than other people? No, we have already said that those who are Jews as well as those who are not Jews are the same. They are all guilty of sin. So, back in the day before Jesus, after Moses, before Jesus, you were born into the old covenant by being born a descendant of Abraham. You are born again into the new covenant by being born into the family of God through faith in Jesus Christ. One is a physical birth, the other is a spiritual birth. Abraham was made the father of many nations. The most important one that the New Testament reveals to us is the family of God. And that's why when God told Abraham to count the uh, pebbles of sand by the sea, if you can number them, that's how many descendants I'll give you. That's all that's said. But when he tells them to count the stars of the sky, and if you can number them, so shall your descendant be. The scripture goes on to say, And Abraham believed God and was counted to him for righteousness. Why is that? The sand by the sea represented the natural family of God, the earthly family of God, the Jews. The stars represented the heavenly family of God, the Christians. And so Abraham's faith standing there that day representing the church, not Israel, His faith was counted to him for righteousness because Romans 4, the last verse in Romans 4, which we uh, won't get to this week, obviously, tells us that just like Abraham's faith was counted for righteousness, so shall the faith of everyone who believes in Jesus be counted as righteousness. So that day Abraham stood for another nation of his, a spiritual nation. There were other descendants of Abraham that formed nations like Ishmael, But the two nations that are important doctrinally to the church and to Israel, obviously the first one, is he was the father of Israel. But to the church, we add to that, and the father of the faith, the Bible said. He's the father of faith. So he became the father of all those who come to God through faith and become part of uh, God's spiritual nation, the church. All right? So... One of the things the Jews, if they wanted to get involved in this second birth into the family of God, needed to understand that they had the same problem the non-Jews had. They were sinners. So that's what he gets at in verse 19. And then he uh, goes through it in verses 10 through 17. We're not going to read all them. Basically saying, folks... When any of us stand on our own merit, we're all a mess. Everyone who's ever walked this planet, when he approaches God in his own merit, is in trouble. None of us are worthy to approach God that way. So, um, none of us understand. We've all together turned away, become worthless. Um, there's none that doeth good, no, not one. There's no fear in them. Uh, not righteous, no, not one. We're all that way, Jew and non-Jew alike, all right? So then he gets into uh, verse 19. Now we know that whatsoever the, or whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Now, Colorado has legalized marijuana. That is the state law of Colorado. You just sit right there, Len. Ah, no, no trip to Colorado for you. 
But anyway, what the Colorado law says, it says to those who are under the Colorado law. The fact that Colorado says it's legal to have marijuana doesn't mean I can do it in Iowa. Right? And that's exactly what the, Paul, what the Apostle is saying in verse 19. We know that whatever the law, talking about the law of Moses, whatever it says, it says to those who are under the law, which were the Jews. So Paul is quoting these verses about no, there's none righteous, no, not one, there's none good, uh, there's no fear in the eyes of any of them. Paul is quoting these things from the Old Testament to show the Jews that the law condemns them as sinners. Because the Jews already knew that you and I were sinners, the non-Jews. And that's what Paul reiterated in the last half of chapter 1. We Gentiles are a whole pack of sinners. But then he gets into chapter 2 and says, Yeah, but you Jews, if you condemn them, you know better than they are because you're doing the same stuff. You got the law, but you're not keeping it. And so now he gets to the point he wants at the last verse of last week's lesson, verse 19. He's telling his readers, I want you to understand the law was given to you to hold everybody accountable to God. So let me read it again. Whatsoever the law says, it says to those that are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. So Paul's telling them, yeah, the Jews are the Gentiles, the non Jews, in other words, are sinners. But the law was given to you to show you that you're sinners. You take great pride in the law and think you're all that because you got it, but he said in chapter 2, the law didn't do any good unless you keep it. No, the United States has some good laws. They don't enforce all of them, but they got some good ones. And um, I'm going to tell you, maybe we would argue about some of them. Uh, jaywalking, I've never been a fan of that uh, law. I mean, if there's a... I'm in the middle of the block and there's a corner up there and a corner there, it's a lot quicker to go here. Right? So we don't like every law in the book necessarily. Got some good ones, but it doesn't do any good. It doesn't matter how good they are if we break them. They've got laws and how fast you can drive in the side streets, the school zones, the freeways. And we might argue they're good laws. You remember when you could only drive 50 on the freeway? That was a bad law. Uh, now you can go uh, 65 in some states, 70 in others, and 75 in others. I don't know if anyone put it up to 80 yet. But, uh, Montana. Uh, pardon me? I don't think they got a speed law at all in Montana. You Montana? As fast as you want. And that's a good law if, if you're in Montana. If you try it in Iowa, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, because uh, the Montana law, whatever it says, it says to those who are under the Montana law. So laws are good. Sometimes we don't like them. Uh, but it doesn't matter. They're the law. Like them or not, they're the law. And so... Paul's saying it only helps you if you keep it. I can keep 99% of the Iowa and federal law and get arrested for the 1% I break. Right? I can go to jail. I can go to prison for the 1% I break. Maybe I keep every rule except one. You're not supposed to commit murder. They don't care that I kept all the other ones. They're going to give me an orange suit uh, to go to prison because I committed and broke one. So that's what Paul's saying. The law doesn't do you any good uh, unless you keep it. And it wasn't even written to anyone, Jews, but you. So that you, in your haughty expectation that you are special to God, and they were in the sense that they were God's chosen people, the law doesn't do you any good except to hold you accountable to God. You have no excuse for your conduct because you know what the law said. That way, because you're held accountable to God, we can now conclude we already knew the non-Jews were accountable to God. We now can conclude everybody's accountable to God. So the purpose of the law was to show Jews they were sinners so that when the gospel came along, they would understand they needed saved. 
You can't convince anyone they need saved if they think they're just fine. Right? There are people who think they're better than their neighbors. They're better than their fellow co-workers. Um, God would be proud to have them. You can't convince them they need a saved. Even if they believe in God. They say, if I'm not going to heaven, nobody is. I'm really good. So, you need sometimes, even though they're non-Jews, you need to sometimes show them the Ten Commandments to show them that they are sinners. Family feud. I watch some on YouTube now and then. Somebody was asked in the Fast Money section, how many of the Ten Commandments have you broken in the last three months? And this woman said, all of them? And everybody laughed. Steve Harvey laughed. I think she's probably not far wrong. Have we put things before God sometimes in the last three months? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Have we held things in higher esteem than God? Thou shalt not make graven images. Have we used the names Lord, uh, the Lord's name in vain when we didn't really mean what we were saying? Did we honor our mom and dad? I mean, you can just go through the list. Uh, there's probably a lot of three months period that a lot of us are top heavy in breaking the commandments. Top heavy. In other words, six are out. Uh, so I didn't think it was funny. I thought, well, there's an honest woman right there. But... Uh, most people, the number one answer, how many of the Ten Commandments have you broken in the last three months was the number one? <laughs> what world are you living in? Have you read the Ten Commandments? Uh, but anyway, that's an interesting thing. People think they're good, and when they think that, they don't know they need a Savior. The law come along to tell the Jews, you need to be saved. Verse 20 in this week's lesson, lesson where is boasting? Therefore... No one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Paul, writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, gives clarity to the purpose of the law. To make us conscious of our sin. You can read the rules. Even though we were never under the law of Moses, you see in the law of Moses the moral law of God. And so when you see the moral law of God, you can see that we fail. And so Paul said, I want you to get a clear understanding of the law. It wasn't given you so that if you keep enough of the rules, you'll be right with God. It was given to you to give you understanding you're not right with God. Now, without spending much time, what did they do in the Old Testament in times of revival when there was no Jesus and consequently no salvation? God had things that pointed forward to the sacrifice of Christ, animal sacrifices. I call it part B of the law, part A of the law with all the rules. Do this, don't do this, do this, don't do that, do this, but don't do that, do this, don't do that. That's part A. Part B is, since you're going to break some of these, if you break them, do this. And they were the uh, parts of the commandments that dealt with sacrificial sacrifices. And so, when people by faith offered a sacrifice for their sin, God looked at that sacrifice of that animal as pointing forward to the sacrifice of His Son and covered their sin through that animal sacrifice. He didn't take it away like He does for you and me, this side of the cross. But He covered it. Uh, the sacrificial animals became a covering and uh, until Jesus should come and die. And then, uh, so the Old Testament faithful Jews went to paradise, not to heaven. And because Jesus hadn't died, nobody's sins had been washed away yet. But they could be covered in the Old Testament. But the point of the law was, it took nobody to heaven. Zero. All right? Now, right underneath here I got... I looked it back up. The law had never made anyone righteous in somewhere around 1,520 years. Now I, I looked up a deal that uh, a, a Christian website called BibleTruth.net that puts dates as close as they can come to. 
Moses started giving the law. In other words, Moses was 80 years old, somewhere around 1491 B.C. 1491 B.C. Now, you know, we're on the side of the calendar where the years get bigger and bigger. Moses was on the side of the calendar where the years got smaller and smaller because it was going to count down to zero. All right? So, 1491, somewhere around then, Moses began giving the law. In other words, he was 80 years old and gave at least the Ten Commandments right away. So the law began to be given somewhere around 1491, since it's an estimate, let's just say 1490. Jesus was born, or, or crucified rather, in 30 A.D. is the most common thought. Again, that's an estimate depending on when his exact birth date was. So, if you take, Moses began giving the law... 1490 Jesus dies 30 AD you got 1520 years where the Jews were under the law of Moses and not a single one of them went to heaven not a one now they're there now but they had to go to a place called Abraham's bosom in the New Testament and wait it out. All right. So they didn't go to hell, but they didn't the, the faithful want Jews. But they did go to heaven. I mean, they didn't go to heaven either. So the law didn't take anyone to heaven for somewhere around one thousand five hundred and twenty years, and we still got people today who want you to keep a bunch of rules to get to heaven. Now the rules they give you aren't even rules God wrote. Some of them are church bylaws or this or that and the other thing. And I've, I've shared many a times over the years. Uh, I don't do church membership. I have a problem. Uh, I was pastoring an Assembly of God church in Gallatin, Missouri. And uh, in order to join that church, you had to sign a piece of paper that you would not go to movies. You would not gamble. Uh, you would not drink alcohol. You would, uh, whatever the list was. Uh, those are some of the ones I remembered. You couldn't dance, you couldn't go to movies, uh, you, you couldn't um, drink, you couldn't smoke. And so I asked him when I was there, so you tell me that no smoker can go to heaven. Oh, oh no, 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 we're, we're not telling you that. We're just telling you if, if they're going to join our church, they have to quit smoking. And so I'm scratching my head. You're telling me that they're saved which means they're good enough for God, but they're not good enough for you. I struggle with that. I tell you what, when Jesus comes again, He's not going to check any church on this planet, Sunday school role, to see who's going to heaven. He's got His own role up in heaven. Hey man, if your name's in the uh, Lamb's Book of Life, you're going to heaven. Whether any church lets you in or not. So that's why I've always had trouble with official, let's get them to sign something. Uh, if you're good enough for God, you're good enough for me. Amen? Now, a lot of preachers would argue with me, and, and they might bring up some good points, I don't know. But i got to go by my conscience. I'm not going to exclude somebody that God doesn't exclude. I'm just not going to do it. So I tell people, if you attend here, you call it your church, and you say you're a Christian, you're a member. It's just an unofficial thing. You're a member. If ever anything ever come up we had to vote on here, we don't have a membership role to check, I would say if you attend here, you call yourself a Christian, you can vote. Because we count you as a member there. And that's how we would handle that. All right. So anyway, Paul said the whole purpose of the law was to make us conscious of sin. Now, the law couldn't make anyone righteous because no one could keep it. And someone said, what about Jesus? Well, the law didn't make Jesus righteous. The law proved that Jesus was righteous. The law testified to the righteousness of Christ. Jesus didn't become righteous by keeping the law of Moses. 
He has been righteous from eternity past. All the law could act as is a judge when it examined the life of Christ. It could find no fault. Because Jesus came here to take the test for me that I failed. I failed at keeping all the rules. I got an F the first time I missed an answer. So Jesus came to take it for me. And no matter what law was thrown at him, he passed it perfectly. He passed every law. He got... Uh, an A plus, zero wrong. And so the law declared him righteous. It didn't make him righteous. He was able to keep the law because he was righteous. But the law acted as a witness and declared him righteous. It makes no one righteous. Why can't the law make you righteous? Because you're not righteous. The law is going to point out all your failures. Now when we look at the word righteous as meaning right with God, as a believer, you're righteous. But you're not righteous in the sense that you're keeping all the rules. How many of you kept all the rules last week? Anybody keep all the rules last week? Sometimes we need to make it simple. How many of you kept one of the rules last week? The point is, the law makes nobody righteous didn't make Jesus righteous. He was righteous and therefore declared righteous by the law. Put her over there. So he says, again, up here he said, so are we Jews, uh, the first verse of last week, are we Jews better than other people? No. Uh, down here he says, no, the law won't make anyone or uh, declare anyone righteous in the sight of God uh, other than Jesus because he was already righteous. So, now we get on to verse 21. So the law is not going to get you right with God. So Paul said, But now a righteousness from God apart from the law had been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe there is no difference. So Paul's saying the law couldn't make anybody righteous. But now God has revealed to us in the person of His Son a new way of being right with God. Now the word righteous takes on a new meaning. It simply means God has nothing against me. If you would sneak into heaven, go to the record room. How do you do that, sneak into heaven? If you would, uh, maybe Peter's taking a nap at the gate. I don't know. And you would sneak in there and you'd find the record room and find all the books and you'd look up David Hanna in Council Bluffs, Iowa. And you'd find that book and you're going to open it up so you can find all my sins. You wouldn't find a one of them in there. You'd open that book up and there'd be one word, righteous. God's washed away every one of my sins. Every one of them. He's taken them as far as the east is from the west away from me. He's promised He'll never remember them against me. Ever. Ever. This new righteousness doesn't mean that I'm suddenly able to keep all the rules. There are a lot of Christians out there, full gospel, some of their, uh, those folk. I had an argument, a doctrinal argument one time in the board meeting. Uh, they thought that we, uh, now that we're um, saved, the Holy Spirit lives in us and enables us to keep the law. Really? Then why don't you? If you can do it, why don't you? The Holy Spirit removed the law from having anything to do with my standing with God. Anything. So this new righteousness is apart from the law. They're two separate things. Should I keep... There? I'm going to be you know there's some good rules. And it makes sense that I should keep good rules. I shouldn't drive the, that uh, little car out there 120 miles an hour in the speed uh, on the freeway. Yeah. That thing's so light, if I hit something, I could probably go airborne. Yeah. I don't know if it'll do 120, but it's got a six in it, so never, never do know. Uh, but I'm not going to find out, all right? There's certain laws that I'm good with. The point is, 
when I go 74 in a 70, I'm a sinner. In the terms of I'm breaking the law. All right? I'm breaking the law. You say, why do you do it then? Because I get there quicker. That makes sense to you? Not much. You go 120 miles to Des Moines at 74 instead of 70, it's probably about four or five minutes. Now you drive like my daughter, you get there in half the time, according to Cliff. But anyway, um, why do we, again, that's why we love the law. It, tell, it shows us what we can get away with. We have figured out that most policemen, most highway patrol, most sheriff's deputies, don't get want to get out of the car if you're going three mile an hour over. You go seven or eight over, they might want to get out. You go ten over, they're going to get out if they see you. So the law lets you know when you get away with. It. Doesn't make you righteous. Righteousness is apart from the law. I can't stress that enough there. Uh, and so this righteousness, was, which is in verse twenty one, apart from the law. This ability for me to be right with God comes through trying harder? No. Through through being empowered by the Holy Spirit to do better? No. This righteousness comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Period. Well, actually a comma. No, there is a period there. Uh, so, that is what you need to understand. Now, why is it important to it? Verse 23, one of the most important Famous verses in all of Scripture, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we need to be saved. Now, I'm not going to get, uh, again, to me, um, falling short of the glory of God doesn't mean that uh, I broke a rule and therefore um, I'm not going to go to heaven. What well, it means to me, again, I shared with you not long ago, what's the glory of Michael Jordan? when he has a basketball in his hand. What he can do with that ball on a basketball floor. The glory of God, I looked up that word uh, uh, in Bible encyclopedias. Uh, man, you, you just have an endless supply of material on the Internet. I looked it up in, in on Bible programs. I looked it up in commentary. They don't all say this, but enough of them say it and it's something we need to understand. The glory of God is the essence of who He is. God's glory is His attributes. He is who He is, who He is. That's the glory of God. Remember, in Genesis, we were all created in the image of God, right? Then sin come along and marred that image. So here, instead of saying sin marred the image, it's saying we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We were created in the image of who He is, and because of sin, we've come short of the image of who God is. We are no longer... You know, Jesus said, look at me and you see the Father. There was a time when Eve could have looked at Adam and seen God. But then they got hungry. And they ate of a tree they weren't supposed to eat of. Now, Adam comes short of the who God was. You couldn't see all of God in Adam anymore. How many of you are following me? So we've all sinned and we've fallen short of the very thing we were created to be in God's image. What's God up to in Romans 8? Conforming me to the image of His Son. The devil destroyed much of that image in everyone. But everyone's still got some of the light of God in them. You want to know why a sinner can do something good? Because even though the image has been marred, he was created in the image of God. There's still some of the light of God in a sinner. That's the only reason a sinner can do good. The only reason. All good comes from above. Anybody does something good, it originated with God. So, I'm amazed how good sinners can be sometimes do some really great things. That's the marred image of God shining through in certain circumstances in their life. But we've all sinned, and so Paul said, therefore, 
we all need to put our faith in Christ in verses 21 and 2. And so because we've all sinned and fallen short of, uh, of the who God is, verse 24, we are now justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. What does this redemption, this justification cost me? It's that it's free. I'm going to be like the word free. We're justified freely by His grace, by His favor toward us. Because when we put our faith in Christ, He smiles at us. And because He smiles at us, He freely gives us stuff. And some of the stuff He gives us is called justification. All right? So we are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Jesus paid the bounty. Sin had kidnapped us. Jesus paid the ransom. He redeemed us from the curse of sin. All right? So, we're justified freely. Verses 25 and 6. God presented Him as a sacrifice. Oh my goodness. Uh, I think I'm just... Yeah, I can't do that. I'm going to put a line here. It's gotten past... That thing's throwing me back there. It's past 12 already. So I'm going to put a line here. And... um, so we'll next week we will have um, where is boasting part two? It'll really be part one because I didn't get to that part today. But we'll make it part two. Uh, we'll have a part two to this next week. 